Holy One, open our hearts to receive your longing and hope for ourselves and for the world. Amen. So my daughter Leah turned 12 last week. Because of COVID, she hasn't had a birthday party since her ninth birthday. Her 10th birthday party was canceled just as the pandemic was beginning, and we never even planned her 11th. In the time between her ninth birthday and her 12th, as you can imagine, she has transformed from a little girl into a young woman. So much of her sense of belonging these past few years to communities outside of our home has been strained for reasons completely outside of her control. But last Saturday's party was full of joy and sushi and vegan red velvet cake. That's Leah. It just so happens that our gospel today also features a strained sense of belonging and a party. In the United States, we often refer to this story as the parable of the prodigal son, but it's also known as the parable of the lost son or lost sons. Much projection and interpretation has been laid upon this story of familial struggle as if to figure out who is to blame in this family for the leaving son's behavior and the older son's resentment and the father's seeming lack of parenting skills. Many of us harbor well-worn assumptions in our minds about these familiar characters. But in a year of collective traumas and losses, with our children and youth struggling mightily with mental health, and many families finding their way forward without the social networks that have supported families in years past, I think it best to remember that this story was never about who was more wrong. It was a way for Jesus to express that God longs to make whole what has been diminished by loss. And for those who can accept it, joy comes in celebrating wholeness with God. That is the context of the parable, and it is the point of the sermon. So I'll say it again. God longs to make whole what has been diminished by loss. Joy comes in celebrating with God. So let's dig into this parable, shall we? We tell our children that parables are mysterious gifts. They're hard to get into unless you're ready. And sometimes they just won't open for you. So you have to be patient. Scholars tell adults that parables are stories that contain a surplus of meaning. The questions within parables are like plumb lines into the heart of our most perplexing and ordinary struggles in life. And in response to the completely ordinary grumbling of the scribes and the Pharisees that we hear in the gospel this morning, Jesus actually told three parables, not just one. We don't hear the first two in the lectionary today, but if you read this passage in the Bible, they'll be there between the grumbling and the appearance of the man with the two sons between verses 3 and 11. So let me tell you about those briefly. The first is the parable of the lost sheep. It goes like this. A shepherd had a hundred sheep. One goes missing. So he leaves the 99 in the open country, trusting they will be okay together, and he goes after the one lost sheep. And when it's found, there is rejoicing. The shepherd has a whole flock once more. 
The second is the parable of the lost coin. It goes like this. A woman has ten coins, but she loses one. So she lights a lamp, sweeps the house, and searches until she finds it. And when she does, she calls her friends together, and they celebrate the finding of the one coin. Her collection is returned to completion. Then, of course, we have the parable of the lost son. One son famously goes off on his own with his half of the inheritance, and the other remains at home working with his inheritance. And when the estranged son finally returns, his father rejoices and celebrates with the entire household. It sounds familiar so far, but unlike the first two, the third parable introduces an angry older son. He's perplexed. He's questioning the conclusion of the parables. He doesn't seem very happy about his father's reckless love, and he refuses to join the party. With him, the father reckons with seeming tenderness, saying, all that I have is yours, but we thought your brother was dead. In other words, to you I've given all the calves we have left. Why are you upset? This party isn't a celebration of merit. We are whole again because he is here. And that is worth celebrating. Now we don't know how the older son responded to that message, but we do know that the story invited a response from all who were listening in to Jesus that day. Could they lean in to the bigger picture, surrender something of themselves to celebrate with God? Or were they too preoccupied with their need to secure affirmation for themselves to join the party that Jesus was inviting them into? Bell Hooks, a famed author and professor who died just this past December, once wrote, I'm often struck by the dangerous narcissism fostered by spiritual rhetoric that pays so much attention to individual self-improvement and so little to the practice of love within the context of community. Improvement is certainly possible for all of the characters in our parable today, and it is also possible for the scribes and the Pharisees to whom Jesus told this parable in the first place. But what we see here so beautifully expressed is not an attempt at individual piety or self-improvement, but rather a communal invitation to practice love together. In the parable of the lost sons, no one in the family has escaped the sharp edges of the leaving son's absence. Everyone has suffered, and the suffering is unlikely to end with this impulsive party, honestly. And yet, the celebration of completion comes before the reckoning. I think that is because practicing love together heals us in exponential ways. The impact of that kind of practiced love ripples outward from Jesus' life and teaching in this gospel moment to the lives of the apostles as they spread the good news of God's love and longing after Jesus dies and all the way into our present lives here and now in this community, in Issaquah. It's something that draws us beyond ourselves and into a way of life we can barely comprehend sometimes. A life of joy in the midst of suffering. Our faith gives us a vocabulary for the kind of already joyful, not yet fully resolved kind of life that we see unfolding in these parables 
It's a way of talking about how God's longing for wholeness pulls us forward into joy. So let's start with the word joy. Unlike the fleeting emotion of happiness, joy is a word that can sometimes be translated from the Greek as inner gladness. It is a fruit of faithful living that runs deeper than feelings or reactions or circumstances. And it can coexist with unpleasant emotions like pain or anxiety. It is a byproduct of celebrating wholeness with God and community. Speaking of joy may sound off-season during Lent to you, but even Lent has its joyful moments. Today is Letare Sunday. The Latin word Letare means rejoice, and it's like a deep breath in the middle of Lenten fasts and penances. Celebration and joy are not merely secular pastimes for merit-based activities in our lives. They are deeply meaningful and faithful responses to the God who longs to make things whole in a broken world. And they're the kind of experiences that empower us to continue on the Lenten journey of healing and forgiveness and reconciliation, even when we feel like grumbling. Letare Sunday reminds us that the eventual direction of our journey with God is joy and wholeness. Our regular worship also reminds us of this. The Eucharistic feast is our ancient and holy way of reminding our souls and bodies that God longs for wholeness. We celebrate together every week by taking a whole loaf of bread blessing and breaking it into fragments, giving it to one another and speaking together these words, one body are we, for we all share in the one bread. And perhaps you know that the priest who stands in the center is called the celebrant. Through this celebratory meal, we join God in the longing for wholeness, and we become part of the whole as we celebrate new life together in God's family. Now, there's one more thing about this communal practice of love and celebration that I think is important, and there's a word for it. The word is prolepsis, and the gospel is full of examples. A prolepsis is like a flash forward into the future, a temporary foretaste of what will one day be unending. Through prolepsis, we glimpse a view of the world to come that provokes hope and joy right here in our present reality. And by these signs of the kingdom of God in our midst, we come to believe more fully in the complete revelation of the kingdom of God that we can't quite see yet, but can trust is coming. The party and the parable, the Eucharist we are about to celebrate, these are foretastes of a future that God longs for, but they're transforming us right now so that we can long for it too. So let us rejoice. All that's lost will be redeemed. We will be whole again. Easter is coming. Rejoice.